Hello, 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 test, 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 working perfect. This stack will deploy on my AWS account the two modules that form the core of Okay, everybody. So then uh, welcome uh, to the last day. Every day we have less participants in the room. The good thing for those working on the challenges is uh, that uh, I created some space in the program. So after the keynote, you will be having about uh, one and a half hours for working on your challenge. So this is a little bit more relaxed. So uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, fifth day Friday, I uh, titled the day uh, wrapping up, and uh, because it's the last day already, and uh, the school uh, went by pretty fast. Um, probably it was also a very intense week for you. Normally I have the photos in the morning, but as I will do the recap in the afternoon, anyways, I will uh, skip that now. Also, we are a little bit behind schedule. Um, oh, yeah, this is a remote from the other thing. Uh, do you have the click already? Did I put... Oh, it's probably there in the back. Just I have it in my pocket. Okay, good. Um, oh yeah, that was... Oh yeah, the track. And uh, it's coming. So um, today is Friday. So uh, today uh, we have the keynote by Antoine that I will present in a second. Um, then afterwards I will present the challenge jury, but this will just take me five minutes. And that means afterwards you will have um, time to continue working on your challenge. <coughs> to um, take the time to wrap up your presentation and so on. So uh, that means no need to ultra hurry now at the moment. It's still not ultra much time, of course, but uh, you still have one and a half hours in order to uh, finish your presentation. Then we go for lunch, and then afterwards you have your challenge pitch, <clears throat> where you have eight minutes. The template is in the um, repo that I sent you, so you've uh, probably all seen it. And uh, so please use it. If you want to add slides or change things, uh, I don't care. Or I mean, it's, it's up to you. So you can do that, but it makes sense to stick a little bit with that structure because these are the criteria that the jury will look at. So therefore, I proposed you this structure. Um, but of course, if you have a better idea, um, feel free to do so. Um, but make sure that you address these points. Um, then afterwards, I will also change the agenda a little bit so um, we'll do the um, closing event. 
Um, I will do a recap, and afterwards we'll hand over the certificates, and at the end uh, we'll do the winner coronation ceremony. Um, here you see already the uh, trophies. You will also all get uh, your goodie bags uh, today that I wanted to give you on the first day. Inside you will find such a cool uh, water bottle with our logo, and I wanted to give you that on the first day. Um, this was also the reason why I didn't buy a sp um, non-sparkling water, because I thought, okay, you have this cool bottle, you can use it. But luckily we had the other bottles that you could use, so uh, sorry for that. But at least they arrived in time, so you can use them uh, at home. Okay, good. And uh, that's, that's the planned program for today. Um, uh, and try to join also the lunch, because now you have one and a half hours more in order to uh, finish uh, with your work. Okay. So, the next action point is our last uh, keynote, which is by Antoine Wache from AWS, and he will be talking about the Smart Territory Framework. And uh, let me briefly introduce Antoine. Um, after Antoine Wache graduated from a computer engineering degree in 2017, he worked for two years at Bloomberg in London on various subjects such as mobile applications or real-time market data ingestion. Then he came back to France, where he started working on cloud computing infrastructure, first as a consultant, then as a solutions architect at AWS. Within AWS, he works today mainly with French public sector customers about smart territories and media workloads in the cloud. And as always, I also recorded a trailer with Antoine, so now we can listen to what his talk will be about. The Smart Territory Framework allows two communities to integrate a very diverse fleet of sensors to create a broad and consistent and view the place, of their territory by relying on open source standards and developed and promoted by the Fireware Foundation. And by leveraging cloud technologies, community can use the virtually unlimited power of the AWS platform to do all kinds of analysis on that data and therefore take informed decisions at a minimal cost. And this keynote will explore the Smart Territory Framework and demonstrate how it can be integrated to create an evolutive, secure, reliable Smart Territory Platform in the AWS Cloud. Okay, um, it was Sunday night. Apparently, I didn't do a proper job. I will just fix it now. Um, but you heard it, and it was a very anonymous um, presentation. <laughs> But here's Antoine, and uh, now you can uh, tell us live more about this exciting smart territory framework. And Antoine, I hand over to you. Now you can plug this, and then it should normally just work. I can just quit. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, Mark Riva. So, oh, yeah. All good? Yeah. Oh, try, try. Okay. Right. All good. So thank you very much, Mark Oliver. So yes, this talk is all about the Smart Territory Framework, which is an architectural pattern which we propose at AWS to enable communities to create reliable Smart Territory platform. And we'll see what it means during this talk. So when um, you want to create some kind of smart territories. What's the goal of a smart territory? What is a smart territory? The final goal for our community is to improve the life of the inhabitants of our community. And to do that, you need to gain insight to take informed decisions. And to, take, to collect those insights, you need, to, first of all, to um, uh, analyze, analyze data and collect that, uh, that data. And you do it in an iterative way. Once you take a decision, you measure the impact. From the impact, you can take uh, informed decisions to continually improve the life quality of the inhabitants of the territory. The problem we have with actual smart territory solutions are the change of data silos. And a data silo is basically a repository of data which is controlled by a particular um, 
entity in an organization that is, is not available to the entire organizations. As an example, let's say that we have some kind of smart parking applications and you want, would like to, to, to cross the data with, I don't know, maybe a, a traffic light management applications. Well, your smart parking applications and the traffic light management applications are two separate data silos, meaning that it's very, very difficult to cross the data to take more informed decisions. And that's the challenge we're going to address with the smart territory framework. If we look at how smart territory applications are composed of today, we will first have a set of sensors that will allow us to collect data through within your, your territory. And then this data is going to be analyzed by some kind of application, I don't know, data lake, uh, maybe it could be open search, could be Apache Hadoop, Apache Spark, any kind of data analytics uh, software. And then this analyzed data will be presented to uh, business uh, uh, decision makers uh, in a way that they can interact with them through graph, maps, bar charts, numbers, whatever format uh, is easy, which is easy to use. And these three elements form what we call a smart territory applications. And here we have an example with smart buildings, could be, I don't know, air quality sensors, temperature sensors, whatever sensors. But if we have another application, we also have these three elements replicated and for, for these other applications. In that example, we have smart parkings, uh, smart parkings applications. The challenge now is that if we, on, if we want to cross the data to take more informed decisions, we cannot because we cannot easily communicate with each other because of a lack of a communication standards and API uh, and API. We also have some platforms that tend to have much broader um, uh, basics. Maybe this one can handle smart parking and smart building as a full software, but every community is different. And therefore, you will always find another um, 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 use case that won't be handled by this broad platform, and therefore the data challenge, the challenge for our data silos remains like this. Now what, that we presented the problem, we'll see how the smart territory framework tackles it. So remember we have uh, sensors, data analytics, and data visualization components. First, we will break down uh, this part with first the sensors and then the data analytics and visualizations. It makes sense to keep the data analysis and visualization part together because they are tightly coupled. Because depending on the question you want to ask your data, you will use different analysis, analytics techniques to do so. But what we'd like to do is having the sensors to be able to provide data for any kind of application. Maybe in my application, I'd like to cross the data from my temperature sensors and my air quality sensors and my traffic sensors. I want to a mechanism that allows me to, to do that easily. And what we're gonna use here is a software component application that is called a context broker. And the context broker roles is to collect data from the sensors and to redistribute it to whatever subscribers, uh, whatever consumers uh, requesting, to whatever customer requesting that particular data. Could be to a form, on the form of uh, queries from the consumers or also on the form of subscription. I can say something like, at that particular geographical coordinates, give me all the data from the temperature sensors in a radius of 500 meters. And the context broker will be able to uh, provide me that data in real time as it comes. Now, how does 
all of this break the data silos? Well, first of all, you communicate with a context broker through an open source API specification called NGSI LD, provided by the Fireware Foundations. It's just an API specification. It describes how you can interact with your context broker, how do you do subscription, how do you do entity querying, entity update, updates, entity insertion, for instance. And that's the first component. Your sensors write to the context broker using the NGSLD API, and your consumers get that data using that same API. But this is not enough. We also need a way to clearly represent the different entities composing our smart territories. What, that's what we call an, an ontology. And to do that, we rely on the second component, which are the smart data models, which, is, which are also open source data models provided by the Fireware Foundation. And bas basically what they do is that when you have, for instance, an air quality sensors, you know you will, you will get the, um, the, the location, the measurement, the serial number, and so on and so forth. All the information you will be able to find on that sensor is described in this data, smart data model with the right uh, documentation to make sense of that data. For instance, if you have a temperature, it will say whether it is in uh, Celsius, Fahrenheit, Kelvin, or how, do you f or you can, how, how, how you can figure out uh, what's the, the, the right unit. So context broker and GSILD and smart uh, data models will give you the basics to create your smart territory platform. Context broker blocking the data and the data uh, fitting with the smart data models and can be queried, uh, fitting with the smart data model can be queried with the NGSILD API. Now, a few words on Amazon Web Services and why it makes sense to deploy such platform on AWS. So AWS is a cloud computing provider and the cloud computing is the delivery of on-demand IT service through the internet with a pay-as-you-go model. It's something similar to the electricity. When you start a server, for instance, on the AWS platform, you pay only for the time this server is running. Once you destroy it, you, stop, you don't pay anymore. There is no kind of procurement, no uh, engagement fees, nothing like that. So the main advantages with the cloud is that you don't have any upfront cost you pay only for what you use. You, because the, all the, the cloud computing services can be uh, controlled via APIs, you have a much uh, higher velocity and agility in your development project. You need a server, you send an API request, you have your server. You need a database, you need some AI, it's just API requests that you need to send to the right service. For instance, the people who are doing the project with recognitions, we just send their image to recognitions, which is a computer vision service, and they're given back what the um, AI model saw on the image, persons, bikes, whatever object. And also, with the cloud, you can scale up and down very easily, and that's how you control your costs. Um, you have a peak in your queries, you can scale up by adding more servers, and once the peak uh, have passed, you can scale down and removing the, 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 the server. And you will pay the extra fee only for the time your extra servers are running. Uh, with the AWS Cloud, you can choose to deploy your infrastructure in 20, 27 different geographical regions, which are uh, the countries in which we deploy an infrastructure. We have a region in Germany, in Frankfurt, one in France in Paris, and depending on the region you choose, your data will stay in that, in that region. If you choose to put your data in Frankfurt, your data will stay in Germany. If you choose to put your data in Paris, it will stay in France. And that's a contractual engagement. 
So when we deploy our context broker on AWS, it looks like something like that. I won't, be, I won't enter in too much detail about this infrastructure, but if you're curious, feel free to talk to me after. But basically the idea is that we deploy your context broker using containers, microservices, uh, and container microservices model. We have an internal load balancer that does load balancing between all the containers, which is an AWS load balancer is an AWS service. And then before the load balancer, we have an API gateway, which provides security features such as authentication, authorization, request throttling, and so on and so forth. For the STF IoT part, I keep it for later in the talk. Now, that we've seen how we can deploy the smart territory framework, what are the challenges we will face when we uh, want to deploy uh, our smart territory platform? Uh, we have two challenges. First one is how do you uh, ensure the cloud connectivity and the device management? Because if you have a big territory, you're gonna have hundreds or thousands of devices and you need to manage that device fleet, do the over-the-air update, be alert, receive alerts when you have a, a faults in your, uh, in your device, and so on. And then how do we manage the diverse communication protocols from all the other devices? It can be LoRaWAN, MQTT, HTTP, Bluetooth, Zigbee, whatever protocol. How, do we, how can we integrate all these uh, devices to the smart territory framework? So to address the first challenge, on the AWS cloud, we have a service called AWS IoT Core. So AWS IoT Core is a service that provides secure connectivity from any kind of IoT device with the, IoT, uh, with the uh, cloud computing platform, the AWS platform. It supports two protocols, MQTT and, and LoRaWAN. It provides also a device management uh, catalog over the air updates, secure connectivity with mutual authentication using TLS certificates, and also a feature called device shadows, which are the basics of a digital twin uh, uh, mechanisms. We have also another service called IoT Twin Maker, which provides more advanced feature for digital twins. But for this presentation, we will stay with the IoT called device shadow, and we will see it in action later during the demo. And so with IoT Core, you can connect devices with MQTT, and we also have IoT Core for LoRaWAN, to which you can connect devices using the LoRaWAN protocol. And the way it works is that you onboard your gateway on IoT Core for LoRaWAN, and you have to use gateway which can support the, for instance, basic LoRa station software. Um, and IoT Core for LoRaWAN will provide you with a, a network server, application server, and joint server uh, managed for you, which means that you don't have to start servers, install the software, uh, maintain the software up and running, apply security patches. IoT Core for LoRaWAN will do that for you, and therefore it provides you with a, with a private LoRaWAN network. You onboard your device using the EUID, and then they connect to the gateway, and the gateway will, will um, uh, send the, the, will basically act as a gateway, as a lower one gateway with the cloud computing services. And therefore, all the messages sent from the device to the gateway will be automatically sent to the cloud to the uh, uh, application server, which in turn will, be, will um, make these messages available throughout the entire AWS platform for, for management, for handling the messages. So for the device uh, management part, we, the, the Smart Territory Framework comes with what we call the STF IoT, which is a combination of AWS service allowing you to use the um, um, Smart Territory, well, use device management and, and, and um, digital twins to effect efficiently manage your IoT and, GNS and devices and NGSI entity uh, as well. The way it works is that when your device sends data, you're gonna get what we call a partial NGSLD entity. Partial, for instance, your temperature sensors send a new measurement. You're gonna get at the entrance right here, 
and partial in the LD entity with your new measurements. And as it goes through the STF-IoT core part, the well, STF-IoT part, it will be merged with what we call the permanent data, such as the serial number, the locations, and any other permanent data, so that you get the full NGS ILD entity at the end of this pipeline here. And then that full NGS ILD entity is sent to the context broker uh, so that the consumers can use this, uh, this, uh, this new measurement in their, in their applications. The reason for that is that the sensors might not know their location, their serial number. We need to have the device management system to remember that for them. Okay. So if we take back our schema, we have the STF-IoT component in front of the context broker to do device management, device connectivity, and, and um, NGSI and the entities creations. Now for the second challenge, well, we have a broad area of different protocols, LoRaWAN, MQTT, HTTP, Bluetooth, and we also a device, diverse device specific payload. For instance, for a particular air quality sensors, we're gonna have a LoRaWAN, maybe LoRaWAN uh, a packet, with a specific payload, which won't be the same if you have another model of, of, of sensors. But what we want is NGS ILD plus smart data models as a payload. And therefore, we need some kind of mechanisms to convert this very specific packet format to NGS ILD for each and every cap each and every sensors we want to add to our smart territory platform. And we, we do that using what we call STF connector, or smart territory platform connector. They are just basically components um, which you can deploy uh, uh, with your uh, smart territory framework. And with these components, you can uh, translate the packets to NGSLD and smart data models. So yeah, I have an example here with Lohan once. Your device uh, send you the lower one packets to the gateways and the gateway forward it to IoT Core for lower one. And then IoT Core for lower one will forward it to a Lambda functions, which is a serverless computing service. Basically, you, you send your code and once an event happens, such as a new lower one packet, your code gets run and it can do action on that, uh, on that data. Here, it will just um, uh, read the payload with the right, uh, right format, the right specific format, and from the information it gets from the payload, it will create the partial NGSLD entity that will be sent to the STF IoT core for creating the full NGSLD entities, which in turn get sent to the context broker for ingestion. Another example is an STF connector for an MQTT device. It's pretty much the same mechanisms. This time, the device is connected directly to, ST, to, the, to AWS, AWS IoT Core. The, when the MQTT packets uh, is received by IoT Core, it's, the data is sent to another Lambda functions, which in turn will read the, the data, create the NGSI LD entity, and send that data to the STF IoT Core and the context broker at the end. So if we get back to our schema, we will have something like that. We have a specific smart territory framework connector for every device we want to integrate. And then we, we have the STF article for device management and the context broker for data brokering. The point is that we, when you use the AWS platform, you can write new STF connectors and therefore onboard new device model within a couple of hours uh, only. I have customers that, that, that did that. We'll see later in the presentation. So what, what are the benefits of a smart territory framework? Why, would, why are our customers using it? Well, as I say, first of all, when you want to, when you want 
when you want to integrate a new device, you just need to write a new smart territory framework connector and your device is then integrated with the platform. And GSILD and smart data models make, it, uh, make the data available for every consumer later on. Then if you deploy it on AWS, you benefit from the security of the AWS platform. So you're, you can build on secure foundations and you are helped to build on this foundation a secure, uh, secure application. And here are some customers that are using the Smart Territory Frameworks. For instance, the city of Drancy in France, they use the Smart Territory Framework to do, for example, smart parking. So they installed uh, Bosch parking sensors on the parking places, and therefore they can, they, they provide an application to their citizen where they can see a map with the parking spot available to quickly find a place to park their cars. Uh, they also use the Smart Territory Framework using the recognition service to detect uh, 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 trash uh, uh, deposits in forbidden areas, such as on the roads or on the, on the, in, on, in the public, space, public space, so that they can alert the, the police and the, the, and the trash removal services to get rid of that automatically. We also have the city of Heidelberg in Germany, which used the Smart Territory Framework to uh, first um, um, have collect data on the traffic. They, had smart they have smart cameras that count the number of cars passing through some uh, strategic points in the Heidelberg city. And with the Smart Territory Framework, they have almost a real-time count uh, and a real-time vision of the traffic at those strategic, uh, strategic points. And then they, they add later air quality sensors. They just had to write the, the smart territory framework connectors to add these new sensors and, and be able to, to um, integrate air quality data and cross that data with uh, the traffic flow so, so that they can have a more global vision on what's the impact of the traffic on the uh, uh, environment quality. Now it's a time for the demo of a smart territory framework, but uh, the guy here has a video, but uh, <laughs> he left the room, so. <laughs> Sorry? I can't, can't think of a joke. So, so what did Master Yoda say when he first saw himself on a 4K screen? HDMI. <laughs> I will show you in this demo how you can quickly deploy <laughs> the foundation of your platform and start ingesting and visualizing data. So I start with the ST. I will show you in this demo how you can quickly deploy the foundation of your platform and start ingesting and visualizing data. So I start with the STF core stack, which is available on GitHub. You can scan the QR code you see on the screen to get the link. Once downloaded, I first installed the libraries with the command npm install. Then I bootstrap the CDK environment for my AWS account. And finally, I deploy the stack. This stack will deploy on my AWS account the two modules that form the core of the STF, which are the STF IoT module and the Fireware Context Broker. I use in this stack the NEC Scorpio Broker. After exactly 28 minutes, the core of my platform is ready and I can get all the information needed to operate and connect my solutions using the STF. I can get from the outputs of the stack the public API endpoint of the context broker, the STF IoT device API endpoint, 
that we will use to provision our devices in the STF IoT registry and the ARN, which stands for Amazon Resource Name, of the Q endpoint of the STF IoT module. This one will be used to connect my data producers. Let's create our first device in the STF IoT registry. So after setting the API key in the header, I create a device using the STF IoT device API. The payload complies with the NGSILD information model and use the smart data models device. My first device is a LoRaWAN Bosch parking lot sensor and if I check in the IoT core registry, I can see my new device created with the NGSILD entity describing my device stored in its name device shadow STF-device. I can check that this entity has been replicated in the context broker by calling the context broker API. Because NGSILD is based on JSON-LG, if you don't provide the context in the request, you get the expanded version of the entity. So I add in the header the context used, which is the smart data models context, and request again the entity. Now I get the entity in its compacted form. You can get more information on this uh, in the GitHub repo of the STF core stack. I'm ready to connect my first data producer. This data producer ingests data from the LoRaWAN Bosch parking lot sensors using AWS IoT Core for LoRaWAN. The same way, with only three lines of command, I deploy the stack. The stack deploys the resources needed to ingest data from the Bosch parking lot sensors using AWS IoT Core for LoRaWAN, including the LoRaWAN destination that describes the AWS IoT rule that routes the messages to the Lambda function that processes the data. The AWS IoT rule that routes the messages to the Lambda function and finally the Lambda function that decodes and transforms the payload using the NGSILD smart data model parking spot before publishing it into the STF IoT queue. Once the, S once the stack is deployed, I can onboard my devices in AWS IoT Core for LoRaWAN using the LoRaWAN destination created. And that's it. I start now receiving data from my sensor and if I check the list of shadows, um, I can see a new shadow STF-parking spot storing the data received from my sensor. I check the value, the parking spot seems to be available. Again, I can check that the data is also stored in the context broker. That gives you an example of how you create and connect a data producer. You can do the same for data consumers. And I give you here some examples of data consumers. One that consumes data from the IoT data lake using Amazon QuickSight. A second one, getting the data also from the IoT data lake using Grafana. And the last one that consumes real-time data directly from the shadow of the devices. Now, let's look at how you can notify independent systems or applications using the subscription mechanism of the context broker. I will use an air quality sensor to demonstrate that part. So let's create first, first this device in the STF IoT registry. The STF IoT device API enables you to organize your devices in groups. In that case, I want my new sensor to be in the group air quality. I can check that the device is registered and that it, it belongs to the group air quality. Now I will create an independent system to receive the notifications from the context broker when data meet the condition that I'm going to set next in the subscription. I will keep it simple. I just need a Lambda function that will log the data received. The Lambda will be triggered by an API endpoint that I will provide when creating the subscription in the context broker. So after creating the Lambda function, I create the API using API Gateway. I link my API with my Lambda function and I can now create my first subscription. I want to be notified when any air quality data received 
has a level of nitrogen dioxide, which is NO2, above 120. And I only want to receive the NO2 value. I simulate some data from my sensor. The first value of NO2 received is 69. So my system should not receive any notification. I can check that in the logs of my lambda function. All good, nothing received. The second one received is 125, which is above 120. So now I should receive a notification from the context broker. I can check the logs again, and indeed, I have received the notification with the data requested. If you want to receive all the data, you just need to create a subscription without the watched attributes property. So if I try again with a third value of 130, this time I received the entity with all its properties. That's it for this demo. To dive deeper on these different steps, you can check out the link of the STF course stack on GitHub. So to summarize, you can leverage the smart territory framework to build effective So yeah, this is the, basically this demo shows how you can use the smart territory framework to integrate devices quickly and easily and how you can then use the AWS service, cloud services to create visualization of complete territories of Grafana, QuickSight and get subscription in real time when uh, event of interest occurs within the context of broker. So the key takeaway of this talk is that you can leverage the smart territory framework to build effective, scalable, and interoperable smart territory platform and solutions that you can quickly replicate in any territories uh, you wish to deploy it. You can do, for instance, what we call context broker federations, allowing you to deploy your first context broker in a local territory and then federate some data to a more regional territory with another context of broker and the subscription uh, uh, API uh, and subscription capabilities of the context of broker. That's all for me. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, happy to take it. Bridging the heterogeneity and integrating things, these are the big uh, challenges of the ubiquitous computing IoT uh, entities we have around us, uh, which are the questions that you have. So uh, thanks for the talk, and I have a lot of questions. Let's see after, maybe I can talk afterwards, because I don't want to. Uh, talk with just myself, but uh, it, I, I follow a little bit the development of Fiber Platform, and I know that they have like some issues uh, in some of the modules that are not like Orion. And uh, my first question is like the say, what you mentioned, like Fire Context uh, Broker, is that Orion or no? Is like an AWS version that was totally built by you guys? Right. So. The context broker basically is a software that broke data from consumers to, uh, from producer to consumers. And the idea is that if you comply with the NSL DAPI, uh, it, the implementation is, is, is complete. So Fireware provides the Orion context broker, but the one you've seen in this demo is the NEC Scorpio, context broker Scorpio from NEC, uh, that has been deployed on AWS. And the reasons are purely technical, it's because they use Kafka and Postgres, which are managed services available on the AWS platform. And it was easier for us to deploy this context broker. Yeah, yeah, because there were, and also like the whole architecture is, is quite similar, right? So when you talk about like the, how to get data through like end devices towards like the context broker, uh, there was a different name, but pro I don't know, probably are familiar with uh, Fire Architecture, but are like the IoT agents, right? That are responsible to translate from different forms to NGSI LD. Uh, when I, I develop a little bit um, of it without uh, like Amazon, but only Fire, and I thought the solution was not so interoperable, uh, but why is that? Because uh, it 
uh, well, we need to comply to the NGSLD format. But all the tools available makes that uh, you need uh, to build a different, well, in that time, IoT agent. Now there's a different name for each combination of uh, protocol and data structure and data structure only. And was really hard to find like reusability for different use case for those. So each time I would need to add a, slide, a new device, I would need like the user would need to develop like code. There was really hard to get out of the box solutions for it. So how, and for me that's not so interpretable. How like Amazon approach that? So we approach that with two strategy. The first one is that we use serverless uh, services such as Lambda so that you don't have to provision infrastructure at scale to, uh, to deploy your code. And therefore, you've seen in the demonstration that Ali uses the AWS CDK, which is a platform that you can use to automate large-scale infrastructure deployment and code deployment on, on AWS. It's an infrastructure as code tool, meaning that you can uh, use Git to uh, version your code and then publish it on the internet. And therefore, that brings me to the second point, is that we uh, develop uh, smart telephone connectors and publish them uh, on GitHub uh, as open source software that you can take and deploy quickly on your accounts. Meaning that in the long term, we expect to have connectors for all the major uh, uh, IoT devices uh, available freely on GitHub that you can just reuse. In like on a plug and play fashion. Something like a plug and play fashion, yeah. And my final question is, uh, yeah. So when you are dealing to a context broker, especially in the use case that you envision, like smart cities connect several different, like. Uh, uh, huge infra infrastructures. Uh, we were probably dealing with like a lot of traffic, a big workload, right? And uh, sometimes even for like the city, it's interesting to offload them in different physical locations, like on edge servers and so on, right? Uh, especially if there are delay considerations that use usually are if you need to actuate. And uh, yeah, you, ha you have like context rules and you act to it. So how you can do that in a, using uh, the solution? Because I, I know that there's possible to like federate uh, context uh, uh, brokers, but that is was ki it's kind of hard because that demands a lot of traffic between context brokers and to basically replicate uh, a, a lot of information. Is that the current solution or do you are working more on a different vision for that? So I don't really understand your question. You mean? Uh, if you are like, uh, if you have a smart city or something like that and you have a huge workload to send to your context broker and you want to scale that and you want to scale that to the edge as well. So you want to deploy some context broker on the edge and try to work, uh, try to make them cooperate. How will you do that in an efficient way? Well, what you would do first before deploying context broker at the edge, uh, you will try to leverage the cloud technologies and mainly the auto-scaling part so that you can deploy more and more replicate replicas of your context broker and leverage the load balancers to sc horizontally scale your context broker, meaning that you can increase the, the, the payload throughput and the service will increase with itself. And but we designed the context broker architecture we saw at the beginning of the talk it, with that thing in mind. If you need uh, more data, more, if you have more query, more data, you But it's scale on, only on cloud, right? Not on like a flow to the edge? No, yeah, we, 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 so basically we use horizontal scaling, which means that we replicate the containers and we then we rely on Kafka and, and Postgres to, 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 to scale as well. Yeah, but if there's latent cons uh, considerations to connect to the cloud, can you like make like, a, make, uh, can you make like brokers uh, communicate with like edge and cloud in like a, a coherent way? Like we are 
seen like papers about IoT edge continuum, and that's quite an interesting topic. Well, I see. It depends on it depends on the the latency constraints you have. So it, uh, yeah, uh, okay. I understand. Okay, maybe we can even talk a little bit more about that yeah. because then, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting topic. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, we have time for one more question. Yes, please. Okay. Yes, my, my first question is, it was probably linked to the first of Ivan. Uh, I've seen that you have a, the ASFT connector. That means that if I want to deploy a, a fleet of IoT devices, I will need to create like those ASFT connectors and translate to the NGL LD uh, application. But how are you handling if I need, if IoT is constantly evolving, so maybe in the future the cloud application about the API is going to change. Is the user that we will need to update the F SFT connector who is translating to the this API? No, so the, the Smart IoT framework connector doesn't work with NGSLD. Well, it, it works with NGSLD, but NGSLD is basically a way to describe entity connected to each other and which has with properties. And then what we use are smart data models that can be extended uh, with backward compatibility in mind. That's the goal of the Fire Foundation. The goal is, the goal is to create an ontology and therefore rather than removing, we deprecate, and so that we maintain backward compatibility. Okay, and my second question will be, uh, is AWS like working in some autonomous, I don't know if it's to translate or to create this SFT and learn from the device and translate automatically to the, to the API, to the NSG LD? Um, we are when when our customers are are asking us to integrate new devices, we develop the connectors and we publish them on GitHub if possible. Uh, the smart territory framework is not a product; it's not an AWS product. It's a solutions, which means that we develop it and give it to our customers, and we deploy it on our on our on our infrastructures. It's not the service in the same way that you would find, uh, I don't know, uh, EC2, Lambda, S3. We, we don't have, uh, uh, we don't maintain the deployment of the smart territory framework. We just give you the code. We verify for its security, but we, it's provided without, without any warranty. Okay. Perfect. Okay, and then we have one more question from the beginning. <laughs> Sorry? I talk later. You can ask, but okay, I get us. I can, I get us. We have time for you. So you were at the first. Uh, okay. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for the interesting talk. Um, w when you were saying like uh, data silos may uh, pertain to different organizations, and the context broker is able to offer customers uh, the possibility to. Uh, merge them, sort of, or like cross data. Uh, does that mean that uh, if you want to opt in in this uh, sort of framework, uh, you have to give up some like uh, data management to towards Amazon, or uh, maybe all the silos are of the exact same organization? So you. you your question is about if I use the context of the smart data framework in AWS, does it mean that my data are sent to? I, I can provide an example. Yes. So uh, if you have like the, the city in France, right? So we right. have the temperature, uh, read, um, I, I believe maybe CO2 readings uh, in uh, smart uh, houses, right? Smart home. And then you have the, the parking uh, monitoring system. So these two entities, I believe, uh, are owned by different uh, companies. Right. So uh, are those companies 
like giving up their access to the uh, stored data in order for the city to uh, do some higher level uh, crossing data or each, uh, I mean, they have to specifically opt in to this or is, is it this by default? No, so the way it works, the way we deploy the smart terminal is that community by the sensors and they write the connectors themselves using the data sheet given with the sensors by the, the, the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And then, therefore, they, they use their own sensors and the, they own the data they reproduce even when it's pushed to the AWS cloud. We don't have any way to access, view, modify that, the, the data of our customers. So you keep the full property of your data. And about multiple organizations sharing their data, it's, well, it's basically a contract between two organizations, and therefore they define the subscription rules and, and they apply themselves. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> cool. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation and the cool discussion. A big applause again for Antoine. <laughs> And uh, f for you, as you are leaving uh, soon, and also uh, for Guillaume, because I didn't give it to him yesterday, uh, we also have our nice, uh, maybe he's in the telco already, we have our nice um, speaker certificates. Um, so for you also, the speaker certificate, you already have the um, T-shirt. Uh, very good. Uh, Guillaume, for you also, the speaker certificate, I give it to Antoine. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you very much for, uh, for participating. <laughs> So now I will just uh, briefly do the following. I will, let me switch to me. Oh, that's me, very good. So as we did not uh, properly see it before, and as you listen to the talk right now, I show you the trailer once again as recap, especially also because I talked during the trailer, and this time Antoine is also in the picture. The Smart Territory Framework allows two communities to integrate a very diverse fleet of sensors to create a broad and consistent view of their territory by relying on open source standards and developed and promoted by the Fireware Foundation. And by leveraging cloud technologies, community can use the virtually unlimited power of the AWS platform to do all kinds of analysis on that data and therefore take informed decisions at a minimal cost. And this keynote will explore the smart territory framework and demonstrate how it can be integrated to create an evolutive, secure, reliable smart territory platform in the AWS cloud. Mm, yeah, <laughs> so uh, thanks, thanks again. Uh, thanks again, Antoine. So good. Now, um, before I leave you getting uh, back for finishing, uh, welcome the challenges. As promised, uh, just a few minutes uh, introduction of the jury. Uh, I happily see that the uh, jury members are also uh, present. Very good.
very happy to have uh, the following. Our uh, second jury member is uh, Tim Cavalloon. I took the last three points from your CV to give the people a little bit of background. So since 2008, and uh, you know Tim already and Samira because they were around all the time. Adam was also around at Falco's talk, and Andreas is also around for a few days, or since Monday at the event. So uh, since 2018, uh, Tim is at the Einstein Center Digital Future, and he's responsible for management, coordination of events and cooperations. Before, he was working at the Excellence Cluster Build Wissen Gestaltung, which is an international uh, laboratory for the coordination of the Förderanträge. I think that was also at the Leuphana University in Lüneburg. And before that, he was at the Presidium Strukturfonds Management Coordinator Project Development. So that gives you a little bit of background from which side uh, Tim is coming. So also give Tim a big applause. Uh, the next jury member is uh, Samira. She's uh, already looking what I found out about her. <laughs> So since, two, so since January 2021, Samira is uh, responsible for the Wissenschaftskommunikation Science Communication at the Einstein Center Digital Future, and you've probably also seen her posts about the event already. And before, from August 2019 to December 2020, she was at the Sarah Wiener Stiftung, and she was their project assistant communications and PR. And from 2015 to 2019, she studied at the Freie Universität Berlin, and she has a master's degree in North American studies with a focus on political science and cultural studies. So also big applause to Samira. <laughs> Our first uh, fourth uh, jury member is Andreas Korsten from the Technical University of Munich. And uh, I guess since 2009 or 2008, he's a uh, technischer Angestellter at the Technical University of Munich, um, where he's developing Phenomenal infrastructures, he's coding, he's managing, uh, he's doing DevOps, and uh, he's brilliant in that, so he really has a very strong technical background. And before, he studied at Universität Tübingen, and he studied uh, computer science there. Also, big applause uh, for Andreas. And uh, as I'm the one speaking, I will read my own CV. So uh, Professor Dr. Mark Oliver Pahl has the Industrial Chair Cybersecurity for Critical Network Infrastructure, Cyber CNI at IMT Atlantique in Rennes, France. The chair hosts 18 professors, nine PhDs, four postdocs, and multiple engineers and interns. Mark Oliver is an adjunct professor of the Carlton University in Canada. He's also the vice president of the German chapter of the Association for Computing Machinery. He heads the future education activities of the German-French Academy for the Industry of the Future. 
His research focuses on a holistic approach to cybersecurity with an emphasis on collaborative approaches, including VR-based cybersecurity interfaces and federated learning. He's an experienced teacher and an e-learning pioneer holding several teaching awards. He continuously hosts events like this one here for larger audiences such as the Talk Cyber CNI Speaker Series and the Future IoT PhD School Series. Um, you don't have to give an applause to me, but I will also be in the jury. Thank you very much. Okay, and so my last slide. So for your presentation, as you did it perfectly in the immediate intermediate presentation, try to talk everybody in the group so that uh, you have uh, different people presenting. Focus on the assessment points. If you want to do more, no problem, but make sure that you assess, this, that you put in the points that we will assess, that you know that are already in the template. And if you ask yourself, how should I present it? Do it more in the sense of a sales pitch because you want to sell your solution to us. You want to convince us that your solution is the best one to win the um, competition. And therefore, you can ask yourself, okay, how does your solution save the world? Do you answer that in your presentation? Why should your team win the competition? So this is the direction in which your presentation should show it. You, don't, you should not oversell it, but you should present it in a way, how, why is it usable, why is it uh, changing the world. Okay, that said, um, as usual, we go for lunch at around 11.20, um, so please come back at 11.20 and then we'll go for lunch and uh, then afterwards at one o'clock you'll have your pitches for eight minutes and uh, then we'll determine who is the winner. Okay, so good luck for finishing with your presentations and with your work and see you at 11.20.